Part of the allure of the wild child myth is the bond that occurs between human and animal. This is what makes these stories so compelling. But would a child deprived of human contact actually substitute an animal for a parent? Several recent cases seem to suggest they would. In the early 1990s, a story emerged from the Ukraine of a young girl living on a rundown farm. Her name was Oksana Malaya, and she was apparently raised by dogs. According to this Russian television report, Oksana was just three years old when her alcoholic parents first left her outside with the dogs. For five years, she slept in a kennel and lived as a dog, running on all fours, barking and eating with her canine companions. To observers, it seemed as though the young girl had turned to the dogs for affection when her abusive parents failed her. And Dr. Charles Nelson III, a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, believes they could be right. It may be that we humans are genetically programmed to seek affection, or at the very least, a stable relationship with another living thing. The question of whether we're hardwired to seek affection is a very interesting one, and the answer seems to be yes. In the case of Oksana, if this little girl was just left with dogs, she's going to form a relationship with those dogs. If we have this biological imperative to form a relationship, if your only option is a dog, you'll form a relationship with the dog. This biological imperative may well be a human survival mechanism. Although we're totally dependent at birth, we're genetically programmed to ask for help, because engaging a caregiver means we're likely to get the things we need to survive, like food and warmth. So it's possible that in the absence of a parent, a feral child might interact with an animal in the same way. John Sabunia sought the company of monkeys and in return got enough food to survive. And Oksana Malaya looked to a pack of dogs for comfort, and they provided warmth. Oksana was finally rescued at the age of 13 and placed in a foster home. But what effect does this kind of extreme experience have on a child? Modern science has discovered that a young child's brain is highly impressionable. The developing brain cells are primed and ready to be sculpted into crucial neurological centers. One bundle of cells will become the language center, while others will govern the senses, emotions, and personality. The sculptor is the youngster's environment, everything they see, hear, and experience. When you see a parent interacting with a child, not only are you seeing a happy baby, but you're seeing this sculpting process at work, hardwiring healthy neurons to build a biologically balanced brain. One of the things we know about brain development is that the brain depends critically on experiences. For it to grow and develop normally, it assumes that they support it, presenting all this to the child. If those experiences are absent or abnormal, then you assume that the wiring of the brain has become abnormal or miswired. From the age of three, Oksana was exposed to predominantly canine experiences. And as a result, she learned to act and respond like a dog. And John Sabunia apparently lost the critical learning and speech ability during his time in the jungle. That sensitive period, those first three to five years, are really an essential point in development for the brain to get wired correctly. If the brain has been miswired early on, it's like having a bad foundation to a house. Clearly, these experiences had devastating effects on the children and on their development. But despite the appalling treatment she received from her parents, Oksana appears to have adjusted to her new environment. This 2001 interview on Russian television demonstrates that she's learned to speak. What makes you most happy? I like to run around like a dog, to bark and howl. Why? It is my nature. Scientists now understand that a child's brain has a remarkable ability to adapt and even rewire, depending on the length and severity of the experience and the age at which it took place. So what about John? As part of his work on feral children, Dr. Douglas Candland has followed John Sabunia's progress for years. 
He's now returned to Uganda to re-interview John as a 17-year-old to see what, if anything, Hello. he can remember about his time with the oh, vervet yeah. monkeys. Good to see you. Good to see you. It has been a long time. Candland first met John about six years ago, when he was still a young boy and had difficulty communicating. He's delighted to see that John has lost his inhibitions and even become an entertainer. But as a scientist, Dr. Candland still has questions about John's story. People's first question is, or is this a true story? Nobody has exactly the same story, but everybody has the same theme. The recurring theme, based on the memories of a four-year-old, is that John ran away from home and was adopted by the monkeys. Candlin wants to examine John's story from the perspective of an animal behaviorist to ascertain exactly how John interacted with the vervets. He's asked John, with Solomon at his side, to piece together what he remembers. When you lived in the forest, you said there were many animals there. Were there large animals as well as small animals? He said that there were big monkeys and small monkeys. There were also snakes and uh, antelope and some other animals. Can you show me the monkeys that you saw there? And then the Zinaziran. Well, he says that the first two he saw them. John has no trouble identifying the vervets, but Candlin wants to establish how John fitted into the complex hierarchy of the vervet community. Mm -hmm. Vervet monkeys will spend the afternoon grooming each other. It's about establishing a relationship. It's kind of like talking uh, among human beings. Did you groom monkeys? Well, the monkeys groomed each other, but not John. This not suggests John. that John was a bystander, not a part of the monkey group. Next, Cantlin tests the theory that John wasn't fed by the monkeys, but rather scavenged for their leftovers. Do you mean they threw food and you collected it? But according to Solomon, John is emphatic about to... this. They collected food and brought food to him. Sometimes they could hand the food into his hand, but none of the monkeys got the food and threw the food away. John and Solomon also tell Dr. Cantlin that the monkeys brought water to him. Well, this is how they made the thing, and they handed the water to him. But it was the monkeys who made, yeah. who made this, yeah. not John. Not John. The monkeys. Dr. Cantlin, a 40-year veteran of working with primates, is not convinced. Few primates are capable of tool so use, and vervets are not among them. Well, I think we are dealing here with some childhood memories that, like all childhood memories, become elaborated over time. I think he did spend much time with monkey troops. I think he did find food that they had cast aside. He may well have found banana leaves that were still had water in them from rainstorms and assumed that the animals themselves had done the fashioning. So when you ask, was John raised by monkeys, I prefer to say he was raised to some degree with monkeys, but I don't believe the monkeys uh, reared him in the usual sense of that word. In many ways, John seems to have survived his early experience of being lost in the jungle. But has he overcome a potentially more devastating tragedy? The abuse he suffered during the early years of his life, at the hands of people who were supposed to protect him. John Sabunye has obviously come a long way since his days in the jungle. The nurturing home of Molly and Paul Waswa has given him a second chance. But he still has difficulties with learning, coordination and language. Is this because he was alone in the jungle during the crucial development stage, when most children learn to speak? Or has something else affected John's recovery? With Molly's permission, we take John to get a complete brain scan in Uganda. At the International Medical Group in Kampala, a slightly nervous John undergoes a computed tomography scan that will produce images of the anatomy of his brain. Do you see that, sir? The scan could identify any anomalies or possible damage done to the brain, 